This episode is sponsored by GT Medical Technologies and Gamma Tile Therapy, a surgically targeted radiation therapy for patients with operable brain tumors. Learn more at gtmedtech.com. You're listening to the Game on Glio podcast with Shannon Traphagen. Welcome to Game on Glio, the podcast providing hope, inspiration, education, and real conversations around the difficult journeys of being diagnosed with brain cancer, including glioblastoma. I'm your host, Shannon Traphagen. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Game on Glio Podcast or visit our website, The Game on Glio Podcast, for insights and guest snapshots. If you enjoy our show, please consider writing a review. Also share us with a friend. This podcast is in partnership with Brains for the Cure. Learn more at brainsforthecure.org. Grief can color our lens of the world. It can change the way we view and see and feel things. For all of us, patient, caregiver, doctor, nurse, oncologist, loved one, for all of us who have walked in the world of brain cancer, grief becomes an unfortunate friend. Even when the struggle is still there, when the patient is a survivor, There are still many ups and downs. The road through brain cancer is very difficult to describe to those on the outside. But for those of us who have walked the path, the journey is unique, it is tough, it is real, and it can be scary. If I've learned anything through this journey, it is that for whatever reason, the universe has brought me to the place that I needed to be so that I could be a source of strength and compassion and hope for all of you still walking in this journey. And that is why I'm here. The Game on Glio podcast is here and exists to inspire all of you who are on this journey, who are walking down this road. It is not a competition. It is not a popularity contest among other podcasts. I exist to help you, to give you resources and to give you strength and to remind all of us in this community that we are not alone. We have each other's backs. As we enter the Thanksgiving season, I am grateful for all of you who listen, who hear my words, who take to heart the stories that I bring forward, and who support me as much as I support you. With that, I want to share a very special story with all of you a gift that I was recently given from my late husband that came to me over a year after he passed away. It shows just how strong the bonds of love can truly be and how grateful we can all be, no matter how hard the journey has been. Heading into this podcast, I had something very unique happen. On November 13th, a Saturday, it would have been the one year mark since the service that we held for my husband, Michael. That morning, just like any other day, I was getting ready to run errands and I was opening up a drawer in my dresser, a drawer that I had opened more than a dozen times over the past year. And yet this day, I opened the drawer and the knob on the outside was loose. So I felt around the inside of the drawer to touch the screw on the inside so that I could hold it in place while I tightened the knob. Only I couldn't feel the screw. Something was blocking it. As I peered around the inside of the drawer, there was a note covering the screw. It had been taped firmly in place, and I immediately recognized the handwriting as that of my husband's. I peeled the note off of the drawer, and in shock, sat there as it read, I love you, and I miss you already. His handwriting took me back for a moment, and I couldn't breathe. He knew what was coming, and here I was a year later, And I was just finding that note that he must have placed in that drawer so purposefully. A year to the day of his service, I found it. He left me a message. It's a wonderful gift and something I am so grateful for. 
And it's a reminder to all of us that even when our loved ones go, they never really leave us. And I needed that reminder, especially now. As we head into Thanksgiving, we have a very special episode, one that will bring a gift to all of you who are still walking this journey, that will inspire and give you hope. And know that I am grateful and I am thankful to know, to hear from, and to be supported by all of you. Our guests on today's episode are from GT Medical Technologies. Matthew Likens is the president and the CEO, and he talks to us about a very special procedure that involves a product called Gammatile. It is a wonderful new technology that is helping so many in the brain cancer community. We will also be hearing from Shannon Akins, who is a 16-year brain cancer survivor. She explains to us her journey both pre and post gammatile. She's walked through radiation and brain surgery before and then was able to use gammatile during a second brain surgery. And she explains the differences and how it has helped her along her way. These are stories that you aren't gonna wanna miss. And I am so grateful to be bringing them to you today on Thanksgiving as we all gather together with our family and friends. After a quick word from our partner, we will be back with Matthew and Shannon. When my mom was diagnosed with a brain tumor, I didn't know where to turn. How do I prepare myself as a caregiver? As a 22-year survivor, I've talked to hundreds of patients, mostly just listening and answering questions. I've visited a dozen of websites, some good, but none I thought truly met the needs of survivors and caregivers. I found what I was looking for in Brains for the Cure. This is a resource I've been looking for. Not only did I learn a lot, but it also reassured both of us that we are not alone. With resources and news from Brains for the Cure, patients and caregivers can advocate for themselves and become decision makers in their own journeys, learn about treatment options and clinical trials, and connect with other patients, survivors, caregivers, and medical professionals through our ambassadors, online support groups, and personal stories. Find out more at www.brainsforthecure.org. Welcome back. Thank you so much for listening to the Game on Glio podcast. I am now joined by two very special guests, Matthew Likens and Shannon Akins. Matt is president and CEO of GT Medical Technologies, for which we will be discussing Gamma Tile today. And Shannon Akins is a senior accountant at a construction firm and has been living with brain cancer for 16 years. So thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Yes, thanks for having us, Shannon. So Matt, I'm going to start with you. Um, I understand that you moved over to GT Medical from another position. Tell me a little bit about GT Medical and what was it about the company that interested you to to join? Uh, what was the purpose and the goals for the company that made you so interested in wanting to take on the role of president and CEO? Thanks, Shannon. And before I do that, uh, congratulations on the work that you're doing with the the Game on Glio podcast, I think there's so much of a need for education in this field. And having been in the healthcare field and medical devices and biopharmaceuticals for 40 years, this is my first time working in the neuro space. And um, I've actually been very surprised by how little information is out there for patients and their families. So you're doing great work here. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate the acknowledgement and you saying that. That means a lot. Yeah. And so you said I moved over from another position. That position is officially called retirement. Okay? <laughs> oh. and, so, and so I'd actually been retired for about 15 months, having exited a previous startup company, eight years and running the startup, and then 15 months of doing a lot of different things, but not working full-time when I ran into the founders of uh, GT Medical and uh, Gamatile LLC was the way they referred to their their opportunity at that time. Interesting. And so Gamatile, is, is this the first device that GT Medical has created or, or engineered in the area of brain cancer, or are there 
other devices under the umbrella of GT Medical? No, no, this is it. And, and this actually goes back to 2011. Okay. And so all five of our clinical founders, a neurosurgeon, three radiation oncologists, and their clinical coordinator were all employed at the Barrow Neurological Institute in downtown Phoenix, and one of the leading uh, centers for the treatment of brain tumors uh, anywhere in the world. Um, and as they describe it, um, they were desperate. And why were they desperate? Well, they, they were desperate because patients who had been previously treated and typically a resection and then follow-up radiation therapy, which, which typically occurs beginning three weeks after surgery, and then it's up to six weeks of daily external beam radiation mm -hmm. in order to eliminate residual tumor cells. Well, these patients who have been through one of those processes and sometimes multiple processes would present again with an operable tumor, yet another surgery to extend their life was not possible because of the trauma and the damage associated with the previous bouts of radiation. And so without re adjuvant radiation therapy, then no additional surgery would be recommended. So that led to the desperation because they knew they could have tools that could extend these patients' lives. And that's what led to, rather than external beam radiation, why don't we go from the inside? Why don't we have seeds embedded in a tile that's made of a bioresorbable material that creates a structural offset to protect the remaining healthy brain tissue? Mm -hmm. And then we're not trying to get to um, those residual tumor cells from the outside and causing all of the, let's just call it collateral damage and trying to get to the the um, the cavity that's created from removing the tumor. If you could line that, that cavity with gamma tiles instead, it would be so local that um, very little other damage could be done. And you could achieve about two and a half times the energy or the dose within that small space than could be achieved from external sources. So that was the concept. They, they designed the product, got it into clinical studies in 2013, treated over 100 patients, and it was 2017 when I ran into the founders, and, uh, and now here I am. <laughs> so, wow. Uh, yeah. So gamma tile, for all of our listeners, is just as Matt described, is a small tile that is inserted at the time of a resection of brain surgery. So this tile emits an increasingly intense and concentrated dose of radiation, but it's done, it's inserted at the time of an operation. Yes, and, and I think, Shannon, uh, to appreciate it, um, just briefly, today's standard of care for operable tumors typically is the surgery is performed a day or two to recover in the hospital, and then three to four weeks to recover at home before that surgical wound has healed to the extent that it can withstand a barrage of radiation on a daily basis from external sources, trying to eliminate residual tumor cells. It's impossible to get all of the tumor cells out, and if they're not eliminated following the surgery, tumors will recur in record time. Right, And so that's today's standard of care. And, and Shannon is much better versed about this uh, to talk about what a, an unpleasant experience that is. <laughs> and so gamma tile, on the other hand, as you said, is, is added, let's just say in the last five minutes of the tumor resection procedure, radiation oncology delivers the right number of tiles to the surgical suite and the neurosurgeon literally tiles the floor and the walls of the cavity that's been created, surgically closes the wound a day or two in the hospital to recover, and that's it. Uh, we call it the one-and-done treatment. It is highly lethal to residual tumor cells, yet these four radiation seeds, cesium-131, by the way, mm -hmm. are embedded in a collagen substrate. And they're embedded at such a location that um, there's that structural offset that protects the healthy brain tissue, highly lethal. It basically sterilizes that cavity following the surgery. And from a patient standpoint, 
You don't lose your hair. You, know, you don't have to rely upon someone to shuttle you back and forth to a radiation center. You're not exposed to COVID or, you know, whatever the next variant is on, mm -hmm. you know, up to 30 times when you're already in a vulnerable situation health-wise. And it, there are so many advantages. So this tile gets inserted and then does the radiation start right away? I mean, how, how does this how does how does it know? How does the technology know when to start releasing the doses of radiation to to zap the tumor cells? And and then what happens once it's finished? That's a great question. So um, the cesium one thirty one radioactive isotope um, is characterized by a nine point seven day half life. So as it's deployed, it is already decrementing uh, from. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the original um, dose is 3.5 units for every tile, and every 9.7 days, there's 50% less energy being emitted. So after about six weeks, after the tiles have been deployed, about 95% of the dose or the energy has already been emitted and, and utilized. And so it's strongest at the beginning when you're most likely to have the most residual cells, and then after 100 days, it's completely inert. So the tiles don't need to be removed. In fact, the collagen matrix is bioresorbable, meaning it migrates uh, into the adjacent tissue and just becomes part of that. I have to credit our founders. Dr. David Brockman is our chief technology officer. and It's really his invention, but he was the, the leader of the team who put this together after a really... Um, thoughtful uh, time in figuring out how to best accomplish this. This is such an amazing high end technology. This is something that you, you almost picture it being like the 23rd or 24th century, you know, hearing how technologically advanced this piece of therapy technically is that's being utilized. And it just blows my mind that we have tools like this at our disposal to help treat brain cancer, which we all know, um, those of us who walk in this community, is just so unbelievably difficult to treat. When was gamma tile first introduced? Because I do know that when my husband was diagnosed in August 2019, I had not really heard about this yet. I don't know if it was mainstream yet or if it was slowly just being rolled out at that time into hospitals. Yes. Yeah, so um, the founders had received a, uh, I'll just call it a tentative licensing offer from a large medical device company. They wanted some feedback on this tentative offer uh, to see whether that made sense for them to accept it because they presented the clinical data up to that point, and I was blown away. Not having been in the neurospace before, I've been in the field of healthcare, and I know mm -hmm. really good data when I see it. And I just thought they had something that uh, was extremely valuable. It, but the other thing that bothered them is this company said, gee, we're going to do a few more clinical studies over the next three to five years before we get this out into the marketplace. And the founders didn't really envision building a company. All mm -hmm. they wanted to do was help patients and they wanted to get it to the marketplace as quickly as possible. So fast forward, we, we ended up getting an initial FDA clearance in July of uh, 2018 for recurrent intracranial neoplasms, brain tumors. Okay. And then we had that expanded in January of 2020 to include newly diagnosed or upfront tumors, you know, mm -hmm. uh, patients who had not had a previous tumor. And, and it's any type of tumor, whether it's a glioblastoma, metastases, or a meningioma, it covers uh, all of those. This became available to pretty much any type of brain cancer diagnosis in January of 2020. Um, uh, yeah, so we started with recurrent in January of 2019. It was available for recurrent tumors uh, in First procedure was done on the 29th of uh, January that year at the University of Minnesota. Um, a patient by the name of Linda, who 
was experienced her fourth recurrence. And wow. Dr. Clark Chen there said that, gee, she's really not a candidate unless I can provide radiation from the inside. She, um, it, he said she had 30 days to live. And uh, so it was like, what's there to lose was part of the thinking. Right. And Linda just wanted to see her son graduate from high school mm-hmm. in June of 19. And so he did the procedure, first gametile deployment, and she lived through November of that year, saw her son graduate from high school. And Clark Chen became a believer at, at that point. He's done more recurrent uh, glioblastoma patients than anyone else and has phenomenal data on that. But it was limited marker release until March of 2020, when we had the training materials, uh, the marketing materials, and everything was ready to go. Full commercial release uh, at that point. So now, currently to date, how many hospitals does Gamatile operate out of? We just had our 50th hospital, 5-0, adopt Gamatile. So 50 hospitals. Yeah. I mean, name brands like Memorial Sloan Kettering, MD Anderson, Emory University Hospital, USC, the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, University Hospital in Cleveland just adopted, wow. University of Minnesota, University of Indiana. So it's uh, every week there seems to be more adopting. And so now gametal procedures can be done anywhere in the country. That's amazing. It's terrific. I'm puzzled as to why all five or 600 centers around the country who treat patients with brain tumors, why all of them have not adopted this. Not that you would use it on every patient, but at mm-hmm. least have, you know, another arrow in your quiver, right? I mean, there there is such a need. There is such a need. And I can tell you that there are a number of hospital administrations and neurology departments that are not aware of gamma tile. Hence the reason we're doing the podcast and uh-huh. putting this information out there. I know that recently I introduced you guys to the chair of the neurology department here in Buffalo. So I think as more information about it comes out, you'll see more heads kind of perking up as to we should have this in our system. So from that perspective, I think that there's just uh, a slow churn of information getting out there because there are also so many people scrambling to try to find ways to treat brain cancer. So that's definitely one of the hurdles. New technologies like ours that are clearly better, clearly better. And and as we generate more and more data, it will become obvious to the clinical community globally that this is a better choice for many patients now who are who are receiving treatments uh, and, and surgery for brain tumors. But but the standard of care isn't necessarily your best option. Uh, so I find that quite frustrating. And, um, and at the same time, we're going after uh, being listed on the NCCN or National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines ourselves mm-hmm. uh, at this point so that we can move more into the mainstream. And, and not be the unusual option <laughs> for patients. So now I, I'd like to bring in Shannon, who is a brain cancer patient and is a perfect example of somebody who has gone through the standard of care and has used gamma tile. So Shannon, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your diagnosis, what type of brain cancer you have, how long you've had it, and how you got introduced to Gamatile. Thank you very much for having me on here. I'm really happy to share my experience, and uh, I, I want to share this because I hope that if there's a listener out there who's, you know, just found out that they have a brain tumor and they're doing research on various medical devices, that if they listen to this, they'll be like, oh, maybe I should ask my doctor about this. So I'm more than happy to uh, share my personal experience but I do want to say this first. I'm definitely not a doctor or even in the medical field. Um, and you'll probably really realize that later on as I'm speaking. So <laughs> I do feel very passionate about gamma tile and how it's impacted my life. Because as you've said, I, I've gone through the whole standard of care. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it, it hasn't been a super pleasant experience over the past 16 years. So I was 
thrilled whenever my neurosurgeon told me about this. And I guess that would kind of go back to one of Matt's points is, you know, I, I think a lot of it has to do with hospitals, et cetera, not taking this on. They simply don't know about it. And hopefully people like me, if I pass the word along to other people, then those people ask their doctors, well, do we have this at our hospital? And if not, can we get it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hope that that helps as well. So now you were diagnosed 16 years ago, correct? 2003, yes. 2003. And what type of brain cancer were you diagnosed with? I was a low-grade glioma. To people who don't know, the word glioma derives from the word glia, and that means glue. And glial cells are the ones that hold everything together in the brain. They provide a framework, and it supports um, the nerve cells, and they're known as neurons. So basically, those glial cells in my brain went a little bit crazy, had a party, and they grew too fast. So um, now, as far as the grade is concerned, uh, there's four grades. Low grade is the grade one glioma, and they usually grow pretty slowly. So in my case, mine grows fairly slowly, um, but it has picked up a little bit in aggressiveness. I'd say that mine's kind of like an, in between a two and a three now. Okay. And obviously, grade four is the most aggressive type, and right. they're usually known as glioblastomas, or GBM for short. Yep. So usually what happens is it's very rare, actually, to find uh, the brain cancer or to find a glioma so early on in a stage. A lot of times what happens when it gets to GBM phase, it, it has grown very rapidly. The explanation I was given was that it, it can grow every 21 days, that it'll multiply. So you were diagnosed in... 2003, and it was around a stage one. Now, did they go in right away and, and do a resection, or did they want to wait? No, they did go in. So I basically found out about the tumor in July 2003, and that was after um, experiencing some problems with my vision with the glioma, and the mine was in the occipital lobe, and that is the area of the brain that basically controls vision. It it assesses distance and size and depth. I see. So I was having issues with, um, you know, like getting lost in my house. Uh, I, I would head towards what I thought where the bedroom should be. And, you know, oh, you turn left here. And guess what? You're, you're running into a wall instead of your bedroom door. Oh, wow. Then, you know, I was headed home from the grocery store. And I was like, I got to a, a point in my drive. And I was like, okay, these houses all look familiar. I kind of know where I am but I don't know what street I'm supposed to turn on next or what direction I'm actually heading. Hmm. So after I explained that all to, you know, the doctor, they were like, well, those are probably like mini seizures that you're having. Mm. So that's kind of how I found out about my tumor was just the whole distance and depth perception thing. And just a general feeling, I guess they call that an aura mm -hmm. coming over you. your sense of smell and taste can be different mm -hmm. for a few seconds to kind of indicate that something's happening. So I did go into the doctor they, uh, in July 2013, and I uh, got hooked up with a wonderful, wonderful neurosurgeon who's done all of my surgeries and um, had my first surgery in August of 2003. Okay. So you had your first surgery in August 2003, and then you also did a standard course of treatment of radiation and chemotherapy or just radiation? Um, both, but not until a little bit later. So basically, I went on a Timidar in 2007 to 2008. Um, and so that seemed to be working pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then 2013, my tumor recurred again, almost completely. So I had another tumor resection. And then in 2014, I did the whole six week external beam radiation. And, you know, I had the hair loss mm -hmm. and then that total fatigue. I'd never been so tired and just kind of feeling unwell. Mm -hmm. I was glad when all that was over with. So I'm, this is partly why I'm so grateful for this gamma tile technology. I would not wish anybody to go through the external beam radiation. So you had the resection in 2013. When did you get introduced to gamma tile? Because that has to be inserted during a surgery. So I'm assuming you had a surgery again after that. Yes. So I went through my every three to 
six month uh, MRIs. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I was with the same neurosurgeon for the entire time. And in 2019, we started looking at the MRIs and noticed that there was a little spot growing. And so we watched it for a while and realized that the tumor was growing back as well as a cyst was uh, growing out of the tumor as well. Mm -hmm. We just kept watching that. And finally, I had my surgery in December of 2019. And my doctor had told me about gamma tile, mm -hmm. that it was a relatively new technology. Um, and I signed up for it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, hook, line and sinker. And I, I couldn't be more happy. Uh, part of it is that my trust in my neurosurgeon, uh, I know he wouldn't steer me wrong. So I was the first patient in Kansas to receive gamma tile and one out of 11 patients to have received it at that time. Wow. So this was very early on. So I'm extremely intrigued to know the difference. So you had the gamma tile inserted. What was your difference with the experience between that form of radiation and the external? Well, definitely no hair loss. That was important to me. And just, I just felt like nothing had even happened, honestly. Like I recovered quickly. Um, I was back to like going on my walks within a couple of weeks, distance from other people, because one of the things that is about gamma tile is that you are radioactive mm -hmm. for the first couple of weeks. So, you know, you're encouraged not to be out in public or around other people. So once I was cleared to, to do that, though, I took full advantage of it and, you know, did, did my typical normal life and just felt more energetic, um, did not experience the fatigue like I did it with external beam radiation. Any nausea or stomach issues? No, not at all. Okay. So with, it, with external beam radiation, absolutely. I had both of those. So um, yeah, no, the gamma tile was, uh, was seamless. Wow. What a night and day difference. So I will jump back to Matt real quick. Matt, I'm really curious to know how many times can gamma tile safely be used on a patient? So can it be used more than once? So if somebody gets initially diagnosed with, let's say, GBM, and they're having the resection, gamma tile is introduced, but then they have a recurrence a couple of years down the road or a year and a half down the road, can gamma tile be used as often as needed? Or is there a limitation to how much the person should be exposed? There's no specific limitation to it. And I've got to say, with the data that we're seeing, it's unlikely that there would be a recurrence in the same location where gamma tile was utilized. Okay. But it's, it's not atypical to see another tumor elsewhere in the brain. Right, because that's how it behaves. Yes, for metastases, for instance. And so also nothing to prevent... Uh, the surgical team and the radiation oncologist from utilizing gamma tile for another lesion uh, that mm -hmm. they're removing as well. Um, and again, since the tile from a previous procedure has been resorbed into the adjacent tissue for a period of time, that tissue could be eligible for another gamma tile treatment. Oh, interesting. So I'm I'm really curious. So Shannon, after you finished radiation with gamma tile, you said. You, everything kind of went right back to normal. You were able to resume a lot of activities within a couple of weeks, didn't have a lot of side effects. How did you feel like a month, two months, three months down the road? I felt great. I'd also really focused on getting healthy as far as my nutrition because something stuck with me that my neurosurgeon's nurse told me. We were talking about ways to feel better and hopefully not have this come back again. And one of the things she mentioned was sugar and how bad it is for our bodies. Mm -hmm. So I went on a keto plan and along with my exercise and I felt terrific and went back to work probably about six weeks after surgery. Then of course COVID hit like within the month oh. after I went back to work, which was fun. But, um, you know, working from home, then I got to go on my walks whenever I wanted to. So it's all good. <laughs> yeah. I felt great. I, I do attribute that to gamma tile and not having to go back through external beam radiation again. And uh, it was just a, a good experience. So now where are you today in your journey? 
Right now, I'm just doing um, follow-up MRIs uh, every three to six months. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, if this one is all good, which, you know, my neurosurgeon's been very pleased uh, since my surgery in 2019, uh, hopefully, I won't have to do them except for maybe once a year. So we are crossing our fingers and toes for that one. So everything is stable. Nothing new has uh, come up since you had the gamma tile. No, nothing. Okay. So you said that your glioma is at hovering around a stage three. It's a stage two, stage three, somewhere in the middle. Yes, it's, it's in the middle. There's a two. It's mainly a two with a little bit of three thrown in for good measure. <laughs> so. You gotta love that the way they measure it, right? Yeah. So that's terrific. Um, it's really inspiring to hear from a brain cancer patient who has been on this journey for this long. It's very rare to be able to have that kind of conversation with somebody who's been walking this journey for a while and really be able to get a sense of a traditional path that they took and then another path that involves some newer technologies and newer clinical trials like gamma tile. And it's something that I wish we had known about by the time it started coming into the hospitals, the pandemic had hit. And then at that point, there were already some signs, even though my husband and I didn't know it yet, that the brain cancer had migrated into his cerebral spinal fluid. I'm assuming, Matt, there's no way gamma tile would be able to help a situation like that. This is something that gets inserted directly into the brain. It can't migrate down into having radiation hit the spine. Yes, uh, that's that's a correct assumption. We call it surgically targeted radiation therapy. Okay. So it really is only effective up to about five millimeters outside of each of the seeds. And so it, it sounded like Shannon has... Uh, a conservative uh, treatment team telling her to remain isolated for a week or two following a gamma tile procedure. Mm -hmm. We don't think there's really a need to do that because of the five millimeter limit. Mm -hmm. Cesium-131 has what's known as a short throw. So it can be very powerful, you know, within that cavity, but, but the power drops off dramatically after five millimeters. So anyway, it's a, just, just to clarify that piece. Well, I had fun, though, telling people that I was radioactive, so <laughs> you can't take that away from me. Yeah, at Halloween coming up, is, or after yeah. Halloween, it's very, uh, it's a lot of fun, right? <laughs> that you can yeah. glow, in, glow in the dark, maybe, Shannon? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we, ha we have a good picture of my family in the hospital room with me and my sister holding up a radioactive material sign in front of me. Oh, that's okay. hilarious. <laughs> that's a good way to uh, take everything in stride, right? Oh, well, you have to look at this with a lot of humor anyway. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's the only thing that you can do. So, and Shannon is inspiring because of her attitude, right? I mean, she's just so positive. We have a video of Shannon and it gets requested all the time. And she's inspiring to a lot of folks. First of all, she has done a great job in persevering through her challenges. Her positive attitude is what you notice more than anything else. And so just phenomenal. Wow. Thank you. And it really is inspiring. And I'm very grateful to have you on, Shannon, because it really gives our listeners, it paints a great picture to them as to how trying something outside of the box doesn't have to seem as scary as it feels to people sometimes when they hear about some of these new technologies and new devices. Standard of care is extremely important, but when you're dealing with something like aggressive brain cancer, it's always a great idea to try everything you possibly can because there isn't a cure right now. And the goal is to help find one. But through the course of that, we've got some amazing technologies and trials that are really popping up in this fervent effort to really find a way to cure this or have it become a chronic disease instead of um, a deadly one. So having an example like yours is just such a great way to showcase what gamma tile is really all about. And you look at this tile and it really, Matt, that's what it looks like, right? It just looks like this <laughs> tiny little tile. I've seen the video clips and it's amazing what this looks like when you, when you look at it up close. So my description to them was, it looks to me like one of those Mr. Clean 
toilet scrubbing pads. Yes. <laughs> so, except that it's got the radiation seeds. That was the only way that I could really describe it because otherwise people are, people just didn't understand what I was talking about. Yeah, so just to be clear, we're unlikely to use that in our marketing materials, <laughs> uh, that, that analogy. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it does essentially do the same thing, though, right? It does clean away. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it, it, it does, and I use the term sterilize. It really sterilizes yeah. that, that cavity. I, I wanted to mention something, Sh Shannon, that one other point is we call it an elegantly simple approach because it, it is intuitive for the neurosurgeon. They know exactly what to do with this. Mm -hmm. Radiation oncology simply needs to deliver the radioactive material uh, to the surgical suite. It's uh, embedded uh, inside stainless steel tray, so no radiation gets anywhere except where you want it to be, uh, which is inside that cavity. But when I was retired and I met with the founders and um, I became educated about what outcomes can be expected mm -hmm. with patients uh, with, with brain tumors. And I saw the potential of gametile. I had been with Baxter Healthcare for 23 years earlier in my career. Mm -hmm. Some of those years as a senior executive, our mantra was critical therapies for life-threatening conditions. Mm -hmm. And we took ourselves very seriously. And this was a chance to end my career with a very meaningful position. And I felt like the accumulation of experiences uh, over the course of the decades that I've been in this, uh, in the healthcare field, it just lent itself. And so our purpose as a company is improving the lives of patients with brain tumors. We're very committed to that. It's very motivating for all of us uh, at GT Medical. Well, you mentioned something about outcomes. I'm curious, can we touch on that just for a brief second? Um, what what does the data show? What are the outcomes for somebody who, let's say, for an initial diagnosis of brain cancer, no matter the state, let's, you know what, let's go with the most aggressive form. Let's go with GBM, stage four, initial diagnosis. What would an outcome be for somebody who uses gametile right out of the gate? So the data says that uh, with a GBM, the average overall survival, median survival is about 15 months. Uh, with a recurrent GBM, the median survival is about 10 months. Mm -hmm. So that's what the data says. Currently, we don't have a lot of additional data on newly diagnosed GBMs. Uh, we actually have five different trials that we're investing in and enrolling patients now in order to get more uh, data to validate the effectiveness of gametile. But I mentioned the University of Minnesota and Dr. Clark Chen before, and he actually has treated, well, the first 22 patients he treated with recurrent GBMs. Mm -hmm. He was so pleased with the results, he decided to go back and look at the data that he had generated for the 22 patients with recurrent GBMs that he had treated prior to adopting gametile. Uh, and he is documenting in a manuscript now that's been submitted to the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, double the overall survival with gametile up to the point where he accumulated the data. Many of those patients, thank God, are still alive. Yeah. And so as each month goes by, the data becomes more and more impressive with gametile compared to non-gametile being utilized uh, for the treatment of those patients. That's fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. And I have two follow-up questions. The first one is, Matt, tell me your hope for the future of GT Medical Technologies and Gametile. And my second question would be, where can people find more information about some of the studies and the research that has been done with Gametile? I think for the future, um, we think this is a global technology, Shannon. And, and so, in effect, we don't require any huge capital expenditures in order to perform gametile therapy. And so for the developing world, this is a much better option because often, you know, if it takes five or $10 million of capital to buy a linear accelerator and be able to do external beam radiation on patients, that's just, that can't be part of a budget in, in the emerging world. 
But gamma tile, it only costs when you utilize it. And so I think it'll be a much better option. We're also looking at utilizing the same concept for extracranial procedures. So outside the brain, our top targets there would be spine and head and neck outside the brain. But we do think that liver and pancreatic cancer could also benefit from gamma tile being able to eliminate residual tumor cells in those procedures uh, also. So that that's where we're going. Personally, I would love to, uh, l- let's just call it lace the collagen tile with a therapeutic as well. So not only would the radiation destroy residual tumor cells, but we might be able to deliver, you know, Avastin or Temozolomide or, or, or Temodar, as Shannon said, uh, some type of therapy since we're clearly crossing the blood-brain barrier. We're going in at surgery Mm -hmm. in order to provide some longer lasting therapeutic benefits other than just eliminating residual tumor cells. Wow. That would be enormous benefit if the capability were to develop to do that. I know from my husband's perspective, yeah, he had to do Avastin externally. He did the temozolomide externally. Radiation was external that would be a huge benefit. Yeah, and then for additional information, uh, gtmedtech.com or gamatile.com will get you to the same location. We we actually have a lot of information uh, on our website uh, and the studies that we're doing and uh, videos of people like Shannon who are doing really well after gamatile procedures. So uh, they should visit those sites. Just for people who are listening, with Gamma Tile, I'm a patient navigator for Gamma Tile. Okay. So it's completely a voluntary thing, but they do have a link on their website that's the patient navigator link. And if somebody is interested in talking to me or one of the other patient navigators um, just about our experience or what we think about Gamma Tile, they're free to click on that and then somebody will contact me and, you know, say, hey, so and so would like to talk to you about your experience. Now, Shannon, just before we end, I'd love for you to share with our listeners, what are your plans for the upcoming holidays? Do you guys have anything exciting that you're doing or um, any big adventurous plans going into the winter, um, especially to celebrate, you know, where you are in life right now? We've just become empty nesters. So our daughter is down in Springfield right now, Missouri, going to school. And so we will just be celebrating whenever she gets to come home for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Mm-hmm. My sister lives in Florida, and hopefully she'll be able to make it up to see us this year. So uh, we'll just be celebrating life and family together. Oh, that sounds perfect. Matt, is there anything else you want to share with anybody before we wrap? No, I appreciate the opportunity to provide a little more information out there about uh, gamma tile therapy and where it might fit into the array of uh, options available for these patients Um, So thank you very much, uh, Shannon, for hosting us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate having both of you guys on. Um, Again, anybody who wants to learn more information, to see videos, to hear how it works, to speak to a patient navigator, you can visit GT Medical Technologies. You can visit gammatile.com. Both of those will take you to the same location. There are studies. There is research to show how well that this is performing. And as Matt has stated already, this can be used with an initial diagnosis as well as a recurrent diagnosis. It can also be used more than once. So I highly advise any of you who are listening that might be walking this path, have a conversation with your doctor, talk to your neurosurgeon or your neurology team, find out if they know about this. And if they don't, know that there are many hospitals across the country that are offering it. And it can't hurt to ask um, if it's something that you can look into. Thank you both for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. We'll be right back. As we recap for today's episode, I want to take us all back to the numerous resources that are available out there for all of you who are still walking this path in the brain cancer community. Again, it's why I do what I do. Gamma Tile is such an amazing resource and it's a terrific product. It delivers precision 
radiation directly to the tumor and is inserted during a brain surgery. It is significant. It is cutting edge technology. And I love that we've had these guests on today to talk about this. When Mike was first diagnosed, we didn't have some of this technology yet available in our community. Now we do. And as I think back on the treatments that my husband received, Avastin played a huge part in his recovery and the time that he did have where there were no symptoms, he was doing fairly well, he was able to go back to work full time after just six months. Avastin was given to him right out of the gate. The oncologist didn't wait for a recurrence. He gave Michael Avastin as an infusion right away. He also received targeted radiation specifically to the GBM, but he did not receive Gamma Knife. That is an episode that we will have coming up in Season 2. He did receive traditional chemotherapy in the form of temozolomide, which is very common to many GBM patients. But there are so many other wonderful treatments and resources available now that weren't available even two years ago, including the Optune device, which we had discussed in a previous episode, along with a phase zero clinical trial that we had Dr. Priya Kumtaker talk about from Northwestern Medicine in episode three. These are resources that I want you all to remember and be mindful of. If you ever need some of these resources and talk to your doctor about what's available, Another resource that we have not yet discussed on this show, but will be discussing at a future date, is a product called Cervax M. It is still in clinical trials, but I believe it's in phase three. They are working on FDA approval, and it has been developed through Roswell Cancer Center in Western New York. It is a pretty amazing product and I will try to make sure I get some resource information up on the website about it until the episode does air. As we head into our Thanksgiving meal, whether it's today or this weekend, as you gather with family and friends, with loved ones, look around the table, take stock of who you're sitting next to, be grateful for the time that you have. This Thanksgiving, there is so much to be grateful for. There is so much to be blessed with. There is a light at the end of the tunnel for the pandemic. And there is a light shining through all of us as we walk this journey of brain cancer, brain tumors, grief, and loss. We are all here for each other. And it is a new day and a new age. And there are so many new developments and new procedures and new products and new technologies being developed. And as we head into a new year, that is only going to increase and continue. The doctors and oncologists and nurses and researchers that are by our side helping us to fight this, they're continuing that fight. And each and every day they get up wondering what more can be done. And so as you walk this path and as you sit down to have your Thanksgiving meal, remind yourself that more is being done. And there are so many resources and so many supports out there for each and every one of you. And I am one of those resources. I am one of those supports and I walk alongside of you. Enjoy all that this holiday has to give and we will see you again next month. This episode was sponsored by GT Medical Technologies, serving over 50 hospitals across the nation. Learn more at gtmedtech.com. Brains for the Cure is an innovative online resource to help brain tumor patients, survivors, and caregivers become advocates, educate themselves, and connect with others throughout each phase of their journey. We are proud to partner with the Game on Glio podcast. Visit brainsforthecure.org to learn more. Thank you so much for joining us this week on the Game on Glio podcast. Make sure to visit our website, thegameonglio.podcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show via Podbean, iTunes, Google, Apple, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd love to hear what you think. Please post a review, give us a rating, or simply share with others so that they can listen to the show in the future. That'll help us too. If you like the show, you might want to check us out on Facebook at Game on Glio, 
or on Instagram at Game on Glio Podcast. We look forward to seeing you again next month for another exciting episode of the Game on Glio Podcast.